Hello everyone, welcome to Critical Praxis week number seven. Uh, this week's topic is uh, set by me, and the topic is uh, I asked uh, the contributors this week to read Karma Chavez's piece, Doing Intersectionality, Power, Privilege, and Identity in Political Activist Communities, which is located in this very exciting new reader right here, Identity Research and Communication. And this particular editor, uh, Nolan Jonah Bardham, uh, is going to be contributing a video this week on uh, Thursday, I believe it is, and I'm very excited about that. So I'm asking everyone to to uh, read this particular article. Uh, in what ways do you do intersectionality in your work and in what ways can you do intersectionality? Speak back to the article, critique, thought, dialogue, or I'll encourage. Karma is actually contributing a video on Friday, which I'm very excited to see as well. Karma does this wonderful job, and I must say, first off, uh, I'm, I, I really enjoyed this article. I think there's a lot of talk about doing intersectionality, but I don't think intersectionality is actually done, or often when it is done, it ends up kind of falling back on one identity category over various uh, multiple positionalities that we inhabit. So I would like to begin there. What is intersectionality? Simply stated, it is an idea that comes out of the work of uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, and intersectionality states that we cannot look at uh, identity categories or critique systems until we're looking at all the multiple systems or multiple systems operating at the same time through one body. Oof, so what does that mean? I would say that one, one way that I like to approach this in my classrooms is teaching students how to locate their selves. Something we certainly do in our program here uh, at SIU is locating ourselves. The question of where are you in this piece? Where are you in your work? So uh, that being said, for instance, I would look to my multiple identity categories that kind of help define or help me understand or anchor my, my sense of understanding myself and largely how I uh, maneuver this world because of these uh, various uh, identity markers. So for instance, I am mixed race, uh, Asian and white. I do at the same time uh, wield white privilege and have that white privilege. Uh, I am queer, I'm also trans uh, and or genderqueer based on the political space that I'm in and who has access to what language. Uh, at the same time, I also wield male privilege, particularly as a trans uh, and genderqueer person not looking for transition, at least not right now in my life. Also a queer sexuality in that by the books, uh, especially particularly here in the state of Illinois, being someone in a civil union, uh, I'm recognized as being in a same-sex relationship. So in that way, I also uh, am identified as, I guess someone would say homosexual, but that's certainly not a term that I like. A very uh, disturbing word, uh, actually. I come from a poor working class, working towards middle class, background and current state as well. Uh, in terms of ability, I, I don't struggle with, but I live with. Uh, Asperger's syndrome. So these various identities are running through my body and not only informing how I approach the world, but also when people are aware of these categories, the ways in which they're also approaching me. And so when we talk about an analysis that's going to look at, for instance, sexuality, right, if I'm doing like a, a piece about queer theory or queerness or what have you, I can't not talk also about race. I can't not also talk about gender and how these things are running through my body and informing my research as well. So intersectionality asks that we look at multiple uh, identity of uh, multiple spaces at the same time. It's an intersectional analysis, not ever just one uh, piece. Because when we look at just one piece, we run the risk of actually dismissing, I think, some of the very necessary nuanced uh, complexities that really inform how we better understand, experience, and live through life. And I think a really important point um, that Karma brings up in this book here, uh, and she was uh, uh, informed by, uh, by other writers, is that when engaged in intersectional analyses, we don't have to always attend to all of the identity categories, right? It's, in fact, it's very I don't think that it is possible to do so. But what an intersectional analysis does is it allows us to approach research, it allows us to approach thought, and even allows us just to think and theorize through our everyday experiences through a far more complex lens that's really a snapshot of life, the life and culture itself being very complex, very fluid, very emergent. Things are constantly shaping and shifting. I want to talk for a minute about how I uh, understand communication and at least how I generally approach it uh, in the classroom with my students. That communication as this back and forth model of I communicate, you listen, and maybe you respond is not uh, does not capture the dynamic component or nature, if you will, of how communication works. And for me, communication is an ongoing flow where we're never disconnected from one another. That as we're engaging in dialogue with one another, and that doesn't have to be uh, uh, like vocal centric, what have you, it can be not even nonverbal centric, it can be the many different modalities that communication takes. Uh, that as I'm communicating to you, you are always already constantly all uh, communicating back at me. And that as a result, I'm already kind of shifting and shaping how it is that I'm communicating as a result of that back and forth. 
but at the same time you're doing the same thing that you are shaping and shifting the way that you communicate with me. Uh, and this is the same when we are engaged in not just this back and forth between two individuals, but also bodies of people that are communicating this constant shift back and forth that doesn't always necessarily have to be on this uh, nice ground of having to accommodate other people. Rather, communication is uh, inherently uh, ingrained with and informed by different power dynamics. And this is where intersectional analysis uh, really helps us understand. On my arm, I have the tattoo uh, both and, and this is very important, uh, the way that I approach communication, uh, critically at least, is that when engaged in this kind of dance back and forth of how communication operates, how it can communicate uh, back and forth or operate, is understanding which identities are salient in a certain space. That in the classroom, as the instructor, when I stand in front of a classroom, I have the power in that space where students stare at me, because this is how we are trained over the years, at least uh, in Western schools, to look up at that instructor and stare and wait for that knowledge to be dispensed into the brain so that you can be tested on that information. That outside of that classroom, when I no longer maybe have that teacher role on, that maybe all of a sudden my white skin is now playing a role in an interaction with perhaps uh, some a person of color, right? That all of a sudden that cultural power that I bring to the table is largely informing uh, how that interaction might be taking place. That uh, conversely, that my male privilege is in a position where if I'm engaging a person who um, maybe reads me as straight as uh, butch or masculine, uh, butch and masculine, like two different cultures there informing that, those two words, uh, I think, that in some uh, context I get read as a straight guy, uh, that all of a sudden I have in fact uh, run across or come across gay guys who, particularly more feminine ones, uh, who don't understand or don't see me as queer as well, uh, see me as a potential threat, as someone who might be the gay basher, right? That in those instances, I'm now seen also as that person who might potentially hurt them, right? So in these various contexts, this is where intersectional analysis helps us out. It helps us to understand the multiple ways that our identities are informing a, a, a dynamic communication exchange. And that the communication exchange is dynamic in that it's never just this one-sided thing, right? That we don't want to risk fragmenting the body that we only look at this one identity, that it's never just about my white privilege operating in a space. It's my white privilege, my male privilege, all of the various privileges that I'm bringing to this space in relative context. And this really means that for me, communication is a highly contextual practice that we engage in with one another. Um, so the, the importance again on my both and uh, tattoo here is that we are all, for me, when I approach not only research as a critical uh, intercultural communication scholar, not only am I approaching it by looking at the multiple perspectives always at the same time, as many as I can, but also approaching uh, research in such a way uh, that, 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 that I am accounting for how each of those identities are equally viable and equally informing uh, the communicative act, right? In everyday life, as well as in activist work, this is a huge problem. In fact, uh, in activist spaces, this is where intersectional analysis really comes from. That within, for instance, for me, in my queer uh, activist work within LGBT communities, uh, there's a tendency to push to the side those queer bodies that don't pass so easily as uh, a homonormative center, uh, those who pass easily as the norm, right? And so this is where intersectional analysis helps us understand where uh, if we only focus in LGBT circles, right, on just gay marriage or marriage equality and not uh, access to HIV AIDS meds or access to hormone replacement therapy, um, universal health care, when we're not making these also the same issues as with the same weight, that what ends up happening is uh, we're privileging certain types of queer bodies. And while it's a very important fight to get marriage equality out there, we can't also neglect these other ways of being within the LGBT community, particularly those of us who are not in traditional relationships where marriage still doesn't help us out. And where, and I do side with some uh, thinkers like Michael Warner, for instance, who would say that marriage uh, as the focus uh, actually works harder to, to, to rail against non-traditional uh, forms of relationships within queer communities as well. So an intersectional analysis allows us to ask these multiple questions and never just dismiss them as peripheral or just in the way, but rather as equally important just approaching these things from a different perspective that are equally uh, necessary. Now a question that comes to mind is which identities uh, do we focus on in analysis or when we're engaging people in communication acts? And I think Karma does a really fine job at pointing something out here. 
Uh, and she writes that on page 31 that this call does not demand that every identity needs to be addressed in every given analysis. As I heard the black feminist uh, scholar Brenda J. Allen quip at a National Communication Association panel on intersectionality that Cindy L. Griffin and I organized in 2009, uh, intersectionality is about attending to quote differences that make a difference. Uh, and Karma ends the article with, there are certainly no rules to delineate which difference matters, but it seems vi vitally important for critical intercultural communication scholars to continue to develop theoretical, methodological, and pedagogical tools and resources to facilitate finding out in vast and varied local contexts. So in, in, when engaging in intersectional analysis, I don't think there's any right or wrong way really to approach intersectional analysis, so long as you're attending to the multiple identities uh, that we embody, uh, that we bring with us to these, these communicative uh, examples, be they through research, through the everyday, through activist work. Uh, and I think that's the power of intersectional analysis, is it allows a lot of space to play with, and allows a lot of space for us to do right, but also to make mistakes, but then to learn from those mistakes. Uh, and I think one of the starting points for the person engaged in activist work and as a researcher is to first and foremost not look to the person being researched or working with, but look at yourself in relation to and position yourself in relation to the discussion, to the research project, to the activist space, and try to locate the assumptions that you're bringing to the table that maybe cannot be attended to or that need to be shifted so that you can attend to other people. So that ultimately what we're really trying to get at, at least in my ideal world, is always trying to meet people wherever they are and never just demanding that they come to you. And that's really what I have to say this week, I suppose. That's where I want to end. And I want to say that I, I, I certainly uh, look forward to everyone's contributions this week. This is a very important topic for me. And I thank you all for watching. Take care and peace.